Hello, and welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast. Today's episode is a best of featuring conversations we've had on this podcast discussing mentoring. Today's episode features interviews with Dr. Clara Lapner, Dr. Wendy Ward, Dr. Dave Usum, Dr. Cynthia Rand, and Dr. Donna Vogel. Mentorship is a reciprocal relationship, that it's a collaborative learning process, and that it generally draws upon the knowledge of uh, people who can provide guidance, usually from senior faculty or near peers and peers who will serve as mentors to those who are starting out in their careers or those who are uh, more established in their careers but transitioning into new roles. So I think it's, it's very inherent to academic medicine and I think most people are um, in academic medicine are familiar with that concept, but I think there's several different functions in mentoring that are really crucial for faculty to get to advance in their careers. The literature shows that mentoring roles can be grouped into two broad categories, and that is technical or instrumental career development and psychosocial support. And the technical or instrumental career development is really when a mentor functions as someone who will advise you on professional goals, give you um, advice on the development of your academic scholarship, help you develop your individual development plan. It will be someone who facilitates the development of your professional network within and um, outside of your institution a sponsor for who will provide you with specific strategic opportunities, someone who can provide skill development advice as well, telling you that you need to develop your grant writing skills, manuscript writing, teaching skills, leadership, etc., or um, someone who will also provide you with the concrete policies and processes that are uh, within your institution to help you navigate the promotion process. The other function of mentoring is psychosocial support, and that is a mentor who will act as an advocate for their mentee, who will serve as a role model, as a coach, provide support, and will promote a value system as well. The literature has been very clear that high-quality mentoring should include both of these functions, both psychosocial and technical functions. And the literature has also shown that women and underrepresented minority faculty, the mentoring network or distributive mentoring can be a model that can enhance or enrich those traditional hierarchical dyadic mentoring relationships between the the senior and the junior faculty member to provide additional areas of guidance that are essential for professional development and that could serve both of these functions. And I think mentoring networks are particularly relevant to faculty groups who are traditionally underrepresented in um, academia. To help those who are just establishing their mentor-mentee relationship, some things to ask to get it started. So in that first sort of meeting, and sometimes it's the first time you've ever met a mentor, if it's a structured or formal program where you're assigned someone, or it could be someone that you know a little but maybe don't know a lot and you're really hoping to learn a lot from them, but that first meeting can feel a little uncomfortable. So one of the things I suggest that people do as they're starting to build that relationship is ask their mentor to tell some stories. Things like, Can you tell me about a time when you had a difficult situation and how you managed it as a leader? Or what was the most important lesson you learned to help you be successful with promotion? Or how do you develop the skill of speaking so engagingly in front of others uh, or reference another skill that your mentor is uh, successful with? And then some of my favorites are what mistakes have you made or tell me about at a time when you had a really difficult boss or colleague and how you dealt with that situation. And these kinds of questions do two things. First of all, it takes you from an awkward, uncomfortable place to a place of sharing. It puts your mentor in a place of uh, providing open conversation and 
you know, some of those questions help make them feel vulnerable, which will help you as a mentee feel vulnerable. And starting to build that trust. It's also kind of a fun way to start as opposed to here's my CV and here's what I've done so far. It, It kind of kicks it off in a more fun way. From a mentee's perspective, I'm a junior faculty member, and I hear about mentorship all the time. Uh, what should I be thinking about or doing? Well, I think that you have to select good mentors. And um, when considering a good mentor, I usually say that you have to look for three A's in your best mentor. And the three A's are, is the mentor available? So the first A is available. When I hear about mentees that are not happy with their mentorship experience, most often the complaint is that my mentor doesn't have enough time for me. So having a mentor that you know is available and has the time and prioritizes mentorship is probably the first A. The second A, I would say, is finding someone who is altruistic. And that means that you have a mentor that is going to put your interest, the interest of the mentee, at a priority, uh, that this person cares enough about other people that he may or she may even um, put uh, their career uh, to a lesser emphasis in mm-hmm. order to assist a mentee. So that's altruism. Right. The third A that I talk about is someone who is a good advocate. And this is, um, I consider advocacy sort of like sponsorship, and that is that You want a mentor who is well-seated in professional society or research uh, groups or at the NIH so that they can propose you for positions that may be useful to you or for papers that need to be written or for grants, etc. So a good advocate. Mm -hmm. So those are the three A's that I think make up a really good mentor. And as you're Looking at for one, you should be considering those. Uh, the other A's that people sometimes mention are uh, approachable, and that's mm-hmm. true. You want someone who's going to be fun to be around and, and, you know, welcomes the mentee to the room. And the other one would be, you know, someone who's affable, you know, to have a good time. I mean, mentor-mentee relationships can be a really positive experience, and you want to have it be something that you look forward to. I love it. So available altruistic, an advocate for you, approachable and affable. Everybody can appreciate mentoring, but if we put ourselves in the shoes of a faculty member, particularly a junior faculty member who may be listening to us right now, everybody talks about mentoring, mentoring, mentoring. Yeah, lots of literature out there. We all understand how important it is, but it sometimes it's it's difficult. So break this down for us. If I'm a new faculty member, how do I find a mentor but more, you know, more than that, the right mentor for me. Right. And, and that's actually a question that I get pretty often is that we place such an emphasis on it and, and, and appropriately so because the research strongly supports the fact that in academic medicine, having a uh, supportive and strong mentoring relationship is really uh, an important predictor of having a successful academic career. But when you arrive in a new institution or you have just transitioned from your fellowship and you are looking for someone who can serve as your research mentor, it can feel a little overwhelming to identify how, how do I do this? How do I go about this? What's the right mentor? And, and a related question is, you know, what would make that mentor want to work with me? I think it helps to recognize that mentoring is lots of different things and and that's important because at times it may be that we need to engage multiple different people to serve as our mentors. Mentors can be, and, and perhaps most traditionally they're thought of as the people that that help us learn the, the research process, the content, the scientific and conceptual elements of, of uh, whatever our research focus is. They can be clinical mentors to help us with our clinical skills. Uh, certainly one that is a critical role is a process mentor. That is somebody who guides you in your academic and your career development, but they may not have expertise in your particular clinical area or research area. Um, mentors can also be the people that 
act as your sponsors and your advocates that run interference for you when you have an issue. And, and one that I find often I'm in this role is someone who you can come to when you really don't know quite what the next best steps are. Should I say yes to this commitment? Should I say no? Should I write that chapter? Should I join that that scientific organization? So having having mentor or men, men, one mentor or multiple mentors can serve many different functions. I usually speak with junior faculty about first know the landscape, understand when you're trying to identify who is the right person to work with, you you need to be familiar not only with the individual's science or research, you need to be familiar with their history of mentoring. Uh, You need to understand their track record. I even encourage going beyond just what you know anecdotally and thinking about research activities and go so far as to you know do a PubMed on this person, uh, find their CVs, uh, go to NIH reporter and look at the grants they're funded with, look at Scopus, look at look at ways so that you're as knowledgeable as possible about what they're doing. Visit labs, visit research groups, sit in on lab meetings, sit in on research groups so that you can have an understanding of how your mentor is interacting and and uh, supporting the mentees who are there. Um, it's useful as well as a junior faculty in thinking about a mentor is to understand your mentor's connection not only in the institution but outside the institution. That is, uh, what panels and committees do they serve on? What organizations do they belong to? And this is not something that you get from one particular source. It, it's really more about doing just a lot of talking with colleagues and others. Just to say, for example, if it were about me, you know, Dr. Rand, you know, well, you know, what's her professional society? Where is she connected? Uh, you can do this at national meetings. You can tell from national meetings often what the level of engagement of your mentor is. All of this can be useful in understanding as you enter into this uh, research group what will what will be the capacity of that research mentor to connect you with the broader world. When I say mentor, these days I think we all understand that we mean more and more the mentoring team. So have that in mind always that by mentor, we really mean members of a mentoring team because we know now that that's really the best way to do it. There will be typically a primary mentor with other members of the team providing different aspects. It might be different career levels. It might be different types of expertise. It might be knowledge working in a different area or a different system, but they bring different things. But they'll be a primary mentor as the nominal leader of the team. The point is, it's a dyad. It's a two-way street. Recognize that there are expectations and responsibilities on both sides of the relationship. So when I mention a responsibility, imagine that for every responsibility, there is a corresponding expectation of the same thing from the other partner. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory Podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.